message, and then we'll apply that to the, the message as we, we go through. A few weeks ago on a, a Saturday, I finished a day of work, I got home, me and my wife were both home together, which actually doesn't happen as often as you guys would think, but we had the night together at home, and we thought, what are we going to do with ourselves? We were, we were bored, we didn't want to stay home that night, we wanted to go out and do something, so we decided, let's go out and have some dinner, you know, let's, let's, let's go, so we went, uh, I felt like a steak. So we went over to the Nepean River. There's a nice little complex over there with a few restaurants, and we, we picked the Lone Star because apparently no one does steaks like those Texans. So we sat down outside. They sat us outside. And there was a nice heater over there. The stars are out. It wasn't a rainy night, and it, it, was, it was pretty good. We were sitting out there. Uh, not many people were around us because of the restrictions in place, so we had our own little place. We were talking, enjoying the weather of the night, heating on top of us, and I'm sitting there, I knew I was ordering a steak, so I'm looking at the menu, at the, the steak items, and I can start to smell something. I smell, I smell barbecue basing, and I look over at the table next to me, and there's a guy over there, and he's, he's ordered a rack of ribs, and I'm going, oh, now I feel like a rack of ribs. I feel like a steak and a rack of ribs. What am I going to do with myself? So I look down at the menu, and they had the steak and rib combo. I thought, perfect, best of both worlds. I get a bit of steak, I get a bit of ribs. And I get to sit back and enjoy both, best of both worlds. So I order the steak and rib combo. I want barbecue pork ribs, and I want my steak medium. Done. Bring it out to me. And I don't know if you guys have ever, I'm sure you guys have experienced it before, but the weight between ordering your food and getting your food, sometimes that weight is just exceptionally long. It's a lot longer. Realistically, it's probably only about 20 minutes. But that night, it felt like hours, you know, I'm sitting and every time the waiter would walk past, I'd look up eagerly, is it my food that's coming? No, not my food, it was for the guy. Is it my food? Oh, it's just the entree that's come down. Uh, they're giving the drinks out. Finally, finally, after felt what, like hours, they put the plate of food in front of me. And I look down and I can't tell what's the ribs and what's the steak. And you think to yourself, where's you an idiot? It's pretty easy to, to, to look at the plate and see what the ribs are, see what the steak is. Normally, you order a steak and rib combo, you'd expect at least half a rack of ribs, and it wasn't a cheap meal either. Probably about three ribs on the plate, a very small portion of ribs, and I thought, you know what? Hey, at least they get to taste it. Very grateful, the ribs are there. So I start on the steak, and it wasn't the worst steak I've had. It was far from the best, but it was, it was okay. I'll give it a passing mark. I get to these ribs, and I was so disappointed. I... I there was hardly any meat on them. It was mostly cartilage. And I just said to myself, I'm never coming back to this restaurant again. And there's my whinge for the night. And you guys will find out how that applies to the message in uh, about 20 minutes. So let's open up to Matthew chapter 5. So if you guys remember, um, we're doing a little bit of a series on these things called the Beatitudes. So uh, the one we're focused on today is the fourth one. And um, Abby, what did you say about me and my Bible before? I don't like highlighting it. Can you guys see the highlight in my Bible? It's the only beatitude I did highlight because it is, I think, one of the most important ones for us to, to recognize and understand as Christians. So uh, it's verse 6 of chapter 5. It says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let's have a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I want to thank you so much for this night, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who's come out to hear your word. I pray, Lord God, that you just speak through me tonight, Lord, and let me, uh, let me be a vessel for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So with this thing called the Beatitudes, Christ is trying to paint a picture of Christian living. So we can't look at this thing as an individual. We can't pull out one of these Beatitudes and just go, hey, this is what the Beatitude is. To truly understand each Beatitude, you've got to look at the Beatitudes before it because they build and paint that picture for us to understand where Christ is coming from. So I'm sorry, I know it's tedious, but I am going to go through all the previous Beatitudes that we studied and just quickly touch up on them. That way we get a better understanding of what it means to hunger and thirst after righteousness. So we started off with blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, one thing that relates all of these Beatitudes together is Christ is asking us to do the very opposite of what human nature is. So let me give you guys an example. Let's look at poor in spirit. Human nature is for us to be prideful, for us to be prideful in what we are good at. If we are good at something, we feel, even if we don't show it externally, but on the inside, it's human nature for us to have a sense of pride in what we do. If we're good at gardening, we're prideful of our gardening. Being poor in spirit is literally the exact opposite of that. It's for us to understand that no matter what we do, no matter who we are, 
we fall short. We aren't good enough. So being poor in spirit is understanding that all of us as human beings, despite what we are good at and what we are poor at, we all fall short of what Christ wants us to be or what God wants us to be. So that's that's the, the human nature. We are we are good. We are the best. We are prideful beings. God's nature, we aren't good enough. We fall short. Second one, we look at blessed are they that mourn. What's human nature? Human nature is to look at what other people do and judge them for it. I can't believe this person's smoking a cigarette. I'd never do that. What a bad person they are to smoke that cigarette. Or I can't believe this person is committing X sin. I can't believe that. I would never commit X sin. Being mournful means being mournful for the sins you commit and the sins other people commit. Now, remember, we're poor in spirit. What we've got to understand is, although we might not be likely to commit a sin, like if you were to ask me, I think it is incredibly unlikely I go up and murder someone. I just don't think of of murdering anyone, but that doesn't mean it's not possible for me to commit that sin. It's just that my, my, my mindset might be a little bit different to the person who's more likely to commit murder. We're all sinners. We all fall short, right? So being mournful is to mourn your own sins, mourning other people's sins, but not judging them as sinners. It's not our place to judge them as sinners. It's our place to mourn the sins that they commit and to mourn the sins that we commit also equally, not more. You don't mourn other people's sins more than you mourn your own sins. In fact, you should mourn your own sins more than other people's sins because you're in control of yourself. Third is blessed are the meek. So this one, we, we had a look at it, and the word meek, uh, it literally translates to being submissive, to, to, to basically keel over and give everyone their ways. And that's not what the Bible's commanding us to do. It's human nature to stand up for yourself. Someone hits you, you want to hit them back. Someone steals from you, you want to get back at them. You want to get even. You want to get revenge. What Christ is commanding us to do in this beatitude is for us to leave it in God's hands. It's for us to not seek revenge for ourselves but to forgive other people for the wrongs they commit against us. So if you understand that we all fall short of Christ's glory, all fall short of what God wants us to be, and we are all sinners, equally sinners, and we're mournful for those sins, all of a sudden the beatitude of meekness becomes that little bit easier for us to comprehend. We are all sinners. We are all capable of doing wrong. We are all capable of doing wrong to one another. Therefore, we're all capable of, capable of forgiving one another for the sins that we commit. It's not to overreact to someone doing wrong to you, but to react appropriately and by God's commandments. And finally, we reach the beatitude we're studying tonight. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. So for us to understand this one better, I'm going to break it down to two different portions and we're going to study them separately. First off, we're going to look at hunger and thirst. What does it mean to hunger and thirst? And second, we're going to be looking at the pursuit of righteousness. How do we best go about pursuing righteousness? So the first part, hunger and thirst. Evidently, some of us hunger and thirst a little bit more than other people do, especially for those ribs. Really disappointed. So what does it mean to hunger and thirst? Well, let's say you've had a hard day of work, like I did that Saturday, that, that, that Saturday, and you, you, you get home and you haven't really had a proper lunch because you were that busy Saturdays. I cannot even begin to explain how busy Saturdays are at work. You've got full-time working parents, and there are a lot of them around these days, and they want their kids to do an activity. Saturday's the only day they can do it. So they bring them to the gym on the Saturday, and it's, it's flat out. So sometimes I don't even get time to eat at lunch. So I get home. I might have woken up late, so I didn't have breakfast. I didn't have lunch that day. I get home and I am starving. I'm I'm ready to to just collapse and just get food to me and and eat it as soon as I can. What do you think my priority is going to be when I get home in that type of a mood? Is it to clean the house? Is it to wash the dishes? Is it to sit back and watch TV? Or is it to go and hope my wife brings me a plate of food or to get the food for myself and eat it? I'm going to set everything else aside And my goal and my motivation is to eat some food. That's what I'm looking at. That's what I'm heading towards, and nothing's going to stop me from eating that meal. Same thing with thirst. Imagine you're outside, you're in the sun, the heat is bearing down on you, you're cutting the grass, you're doing the gardening, you put up the laundry, you're taking down the laundry, whatever. Your your throat is the Sahara Desert. Fun fact, Sahara literally means desert. So by saying Sahara Desert, you're saying desert, desert. Irrelevant, but I thought that was cool. Sahara Desert, your throat is dry, it's parched. You get back inside after working in the sun all day, what are you going to do? Are you going to fold the laundry you just took off the line? No, forget it, the laundry can wait. 
you're going to go grab a drink of water. So to hunger and thirst in this context isn't literally hungering and thirsting because righteousness isn't exactly something we can eat. It's to pursue. It's to set as our goal. It's to head towards, keep at, like the, the marksman watches the target. That's your target. That's what you're going to work towards. And Christ is commanding us to pursue, to set as our goal, righteousness. We're going to stop for a bit and we're going to reflect on two lives, two Christian lives of the Bible. These guys were Christian men. But we're going to look at these lives, compare feats with one another, and have a look at what they had set as their targets. So the first life we're going to look at is the life of Daniel. The second life we're going to look at is the life of Samson. Now, as a little boy growing up through Sunday school, I thought Samson was the coolest person around. What little boy doesn't want to have long hair and rippling muscles? Let's be real, right? So you look at the life of, of, of Daniel and Samson. You look, Daniel starts off, and we read in Daniel chapter 1, he's refusing the king's meat because he wants to eat lentils instead. Cool. I mean, I like lentils just as much as the next guy, but you put meat in front of me, that meat's going. It's gone. Look at the first thing we read in Samson's life. And he's gone and he's wrestled a lion, he's killed it, and then he's found honey inside of this dead body, the, the, the lion's dead body, and he goes and he eats the lion. I don't know, but that sounds a lot cooler than eating lentils to me. Right? We'll, we'll look at the second thing we read in Daniel's life. Daniel, he goes on and um, he interprets the king's dream. Now, he doesn't have any knowledge of what this dream is, but God gives him the wisdom and he interprets it to the king and the king gets really happy with him. That's, that's all right. I mean, he didn't know what the dream was, but Joseph did that earlier in the Bible. I mean, he's just repeating what Joseph did before. That's not too cool in my mind. But then we look at what Samson did. Samson, after being fooled by the Philistines and having his supposed wife married off to someone else, he's gone with his bare hands and caught 300 foxes. You know how hard it is to catch a fox? Like, I've tried to catch my dog when he's running away from me. My dog's probably not as nimble as a fox. And it is mission impossible. Like, I cannot catch this dog. If he wants to get away from me, he's gone. Unless I've got him on a leash, then I win. But to catch 300 of these foxes, Samson wasn't just strong, but he was quick, he was agile, and he was nimble. He caught 300 of them, he lit their tails on fire, he let them loose in one of the Philistine cities, and all their crops burnt down. What a legend. What a champion. We keep going. Daniel's life. Next, we hear the hand appears on the wall, and he writes some stuff in Hebrew, which is his native tongue. And he goes and he reads the Hebrew, and everyone in that room dies. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's all right. It's not like he did much. He just read the writing. We go to Samson, and he's trapped in the Philistine city. They're planning on capturing him and killing him. He rips this giant gate off its hinges. Now, this wasn't just like, like a door. This thing was probably, I, imagine, I, I don't know, as a kid, I always imagined it like really high, the height, like the height of this church building. And he's gone, and he's ripped it off the wall, and he's walked up a hill to make a point up a hill with this giant one-ton door, plants it on top of the hill, and walks away, mate. You can, can you see why I wanted to be like Samson growing up? Who didn't want to be able to do those things? But last thing we read in Daniel's story, I, I reckon this last one's pretty cool. I mean, he gets cast into the lion's den. The lions don't eat him, and he gets to spend the night with the lions. I mean, if you could guarantee that the lions wouldn't eat me, I wouldn't mind spending a night with lions either. That, that, that one was pretty cool, right? But Samson, at the end of his life, gets his eyes plucked out of his head, and he pushes down these two pillars and kills more Philistines in his death than he killed in his life. And he killed a lot of Philistines. One time he even grabbed the jawbone of a donkey and slew a thousand of them. But he killed more Philistines in his death than he ever did in his life. Now we compare these feats with each other, and all of a sudden you're thinking Samson wins in a landslide. He's got this in the bag. He's the coolest dude in the Bible. But let's, look, let's take a step behind and look at what was motivating Samson compared to what was motivating Daniel. Now, Daniel, all through his life, all through these feats, there was one thing that he headed towards. There was one thing he had set at his target. And he was chasing that goal relentlessly. And God rewarded him mightily for chasing that goal. And that was to pursue righteousness. He was there doing what was right, not based on what he thought, but based on what God thought. When he ate those lentils, it was because the meat on the king's table was sacrificed to idols. He didn't want to partake in that. So through his guilt and through his pursuit of righteousness, he decided, I'm not going to eat that meat. I'm going to keep eating my lentils. And God blessed him because of that. He ended up going 
big and strong, eating lentils and drinking water. Who would have known? He interpreted the king's dream because none of the other wise men through their mystic feats were able to interpret the king's dream. But he directly gives God the glory for interpreting that dream, higher praising God in the sight of King Nebuchadnezzar. Again, pursuing righteousness. It wasn't about Daniel. It was about God. He read the writing on the wall, and everyone in that room died. Why? Because they were desecrating the plates and the cups that were from the temple of God. They were using them to have a party and drink wine and, and be merry. And he knew that these things were items from the inner of inners, from the temple of God. So as a result, he read that writing, and God delivered the death to the people who had desecrated his items. It was about God. It wasn't about him. And again, Daniel in the lion's den. I used to think as a kid, why did he open the balcony? I mean, he could have prayed just the same as he did every other time. Could have kept the balcony closed. Could have sat down in front of his bed. He could have still faced towards the temple and prayed. Why did he open the balcony? And it wasn't a sense of pride for Daniel. No, no, no. He opened that balcony because his fear of God was greater than fear of man. And he did what was right in the sight of God over what he thought was right in the sight of man. So he pursued God with vengeance and with justice. He didn't stop. He kept his eye on God and kept marking that target. And all throughout, God sheltered him, God protected him, and God blessed him, blessed him mightily. Whereas Samson, all those feats I said were an act of revenge, were an act of self-gratification, was in pursuit of ungodly women. Everything he did in his life up until his death, the only time he did something good for God, for what was right, was when he pushed over those pillars and killed more Philistines in his death than he did through his life. He spent his life gratifying himself and looking to please himself and had his own goals. He didn't care what was right before God. He only cared about what was right before Samson. The only time he cared was in his death, and in his death, he did more for God than he ever did through his entire life. He killed more Philistines in his death than he did through his life, and that's just, that's just saying something. Now, here's a bit of a personal testimony from myself. At age 13, I got saved. I was sitting in the church pew, and the pastor was preaching about how we ought, ought to go out and uh, uh, be witnesses for Christ. And I, I grew up in Sunday school. I knew all the Sunday school stories, and at that moment in time of my life, everything kind of clicked into place, and I fully understood what the gospel message was. And at that point, I gave myself to Christ, and I became a born-again Christian. At age 14, I played my first season of rugby league. Loved the sport. Loved it so much. And to this day, I still have a strong affection for this sport called rugby league. So under 14s, I remember scoring my first try. I remember my first big hit. All these great, powerful, in my mind, it was, it was immaculate. Like, it was the best season ever. Uh, and, and, and I had so much fun and fell in love, but it didn't really affect church. I mean... At the time, the church I was going to was Wednesday night Bible study and Sunday afternoon church service. So I could go to trainings on the Tuesday, Thursday night, play my games on a Saturday morning, and it didn't really have too much of a bearing. The next year, under 15s, my focus changed a little. It wasn't about the sport and the love of the sport anymore. What happened was, at the end of the season, under 15s, one of my best mates from school got picked to trial for Parramatta. And that was the team. I, I still go for them. That, that, that was my team, you know. So I saw my mate in his paramedic gear trialing out for the team, and then I just thought, mate, that's what I want to do. That's what I, I, want, I want to trial for the Eels as well. I want to play for the Eels. And that became my goal. That became what I started to strive towards. So under 16s, I started to train. I had a job to pay for gym membership, and I went to the gym. I started to work out. I started to watch my diet. I started to do... Basically, my life, my weekly plan was mapped out around my training sessions for rugby league, for gym, and my own things, my own pursuits, and the game on the weekend. That became my priority in life, and I had a great season under 16s. I was top try scorer for my team. I was best and fairest at the end of the year, and I got picked to trial for the Parramatta Eels, the under-18s SG ball team. Two years young, and I got picked. Brilliant. I didn't make it. Didn't make it. I was told I was a little too big to be playing in the position I was. I was playing in the centers, which contrary to the way it sounds, is the second player in from the wing. And you have to be a little more agile, a little bit more nimble than I was. And I was, I'm, I'm a pretty clumsy guy. So I wasn't quite what they were looking for to fit the team. But they told me on the day, make a switch to play in the forwards. 
playing the forwards, you got more potential there. So next season, under 17s, I didn't play. I was my HSC year, my mum wouldn't let me. So the next year, I played C grade, Division One, and I made the switch to the forward pack. And I'll never forget that year for two very important reasons. I'll never forget one game in that year for, for two very important reasons. It was about June, July. I was playing against Greystains, and I was playing in the forward pack. And by far, I was having the best game I ever played, ever. To this very day, I haven't played a game better than that game. I scored a few tries. I was putting on big hits. Every single one of my runs, I was making 15 to 20 meters. I was unstoppable that game, right? And about the 30-minute mark is when the coach would generally get me off the field to have a rest and refresh, ready to go for the second half. And as I'm walking off that field, the crowd starts applauding and cheering. And I'm thinking, what, did we score another try? No. The crowd was applauding and cheering for me. And to me, in that moment, I'd, I'd made my goal. In that moment, walking off the field, you've got kids sticking out their hands to give me a high five. I'm, I'm giving them the high fives as I'm walking past. I've got people I don't even know telling me how well I played. And I'm thinking, man, I'm the superstar. I made it. I'm, I'm the legend, you know. I'm, I'm, everything that I've done, all this training that I've worked towards, I'm here. Sat down on that bench. The coach gave me a hug before I sat down on the bench. Mate, I, I, I must have had a cracker of a game, let me tell you. Ten minutes into the second half, I get back onto the field, and I picked up where I left off. We were dominating this team. It was like 40 or 50 nil. Like, they had no chance of coming back. It was the last minute of the game. I went up to put a big hit on this. I've been targeting him the whole game. Targeting him. Every time he got the ball, I went up to smash him. And he went and he offloaded the ball to someone else. He fooled me. He tricked me. He offloaded the ball to someone else as I went to do the big hit on him, and he started to run the angle behind him. And I'm like, nah, you're not getting away from me. I dove, full reach, grabbed onto his jersey. He kept on running and running and running, and something had to give. In that moment, I dislocated and broke my shoulder. Out of a choice in my own pride, I dove and tried to stop this person. I didn't want to let go of his jersey. I didn't, and it broke my shoulder. My shoulder was hanging limp down over here, and at the time, I didn't realize it was broken. I thought it was dislocated. So we went to the hospital. I put it all back into place. They didn't give me an x-ray over the, at the hospital. They gave me a letter to give my GP. I threw it in the bin on the way out, and I said, I'll be back playing footy in the next couple of weeks. In the sling... Went to watch the game the next week, and the bloke that replaced me, the person who replaced me, got called up to play under 20s for the Eels. So I went from the highest of highs, feeling like the superstar that I thought I was, to all of a sudden, I'm just the injured guy on the sideline, arm in a sling. And this guy, mind you, had a cracker of a game himself and fully deserved it. He took my spot. He was my replacement, and he took my spot in the team. Devastating. But anyways, that's just a little side story. With that side story, whose life did I more closely represent? Samson or Daniel? Definitely Samson. See, I wasn't doing it for, for righteous reasons. I wasn't doing it for godly reasons. I was doing it because that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I wanted to chase. And I wanted the glory. I wanted to hop off the field and have the crowd cheer for me and give the kids a high five. I wanted all of that. It wasn't about God at all. And that pattern continued on, and, and I'd, I'd come to church dressed in my footy gear so I could leave early and go play my footy games and do a whole bunch of nonsense like that. And what I'm trying to tell you now is, you guys might not think it, but the decisions you make at your age now play a part in the life to come in the future. You take me back to a footy field these days, and I feel like there's a beast inside of me that wakes up and wants to start playing again and going through that weekly grind and performing, and I want to play, and I want to hear the cheering, and I want to go through it all again. Because that's what I focused on through my teenage years. Up until I was 20 years old, that was my drive. That was my motivation, and that was what drove, drove me to, to perform. I wanted to be the best that I was. And at that point, let's open to Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Now, 
To add to that, we're going to turn to Galatians. And I promise this is the last one we're turning to. Galatians chapter 5, and we'll read verses 16 and 17. So Galatians chapter 5, we'll start at verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one, one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So what we see over here is the pattern of life. We read in Romans 8.5, you focus on things of the flesh, and what happens? You start seeing things of the flesh. You start hearing things of the flesh. You start doing things of the flesh. All these things of the flesh start popping out to you. When I was 16, 17, 18, 19, focusing on rugby league, focusing on my training, focusing on my performance, what do you think I'd be seeing everywhere I went? I'd be looking and there'd be opportunity for me to get better at something. I'd be listening and I'd be hearing on the radio about the footy. I'd be watching and I'd be watching, I don't know, even walking in the shopping centers. I kid you not, I'd walk and pretend like I was stepping past people and trying to maneuver around them to score a try. I see kids these days walking around. If they're into basketball, they're doing these ones as they're walking. They're pretending they're bouncing basketballs. If they're into their video games, it's like they're playing their video games as they're walking through the shops. You focus on things of the flesh and you begin thinking. You start acting. You start doing things of the flesh. Put something that's in the flesh as your target and that's what you'll become. But you focus on things of the spirit. Focus on things of the spirit and the same thing applies to the spirit. So focus on things of God you start hearing things of God. You start seeing things of God. You start doing, you start acting things of God. Focus on righteousness, and righteousness will appear to you. And we read in Galatians, when you're focusing on the flesh, what gets repelled? The spirit. So if when you focus on things of the flesh, what's being pushed away from you? Things of the spirit. If you focus on things of the spirit, what's being pushed away from you? Things of the flesh. Things of the flesh. So I hope you guys get a better understanding now of what it means to hunger and thirst after something. It's not just your everyday, yeah, I might do it. It's not just your everyday, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll play the piano today, no problems. Or I might read my Bible today. I'll do it for fun. It's not a light decision to make. To hunger and thirst after something is to dedicate hours and hours of your time to get that goal. It wasn't like when I was 14 and playing rugby league for fun. No, no. It was like when I was 18 or 19 and playing rugby league was I intended to pursue a professional career in that area. And I dedicated my entire time to that career. So when we're dedicating our time to things of righteousness, to pursue righteousness, we've got to dedicate the bulk of our time. Let's get back to the story, my whinge session at the start. That restaurant. Let's say the restaurant represents you. It wasn't Lone Star, but it's your name. Wes, big Wes's, right? The food that you're serving, the ribs, represents your time. Now, at the time when I was pursuing rugby league as my career, what do you think God would have been served in my restaurant? I would have been lucky to have gotten served at that point. Let me just be, be, be brutally honest. What God wants from us isn't the offcuts of your time. What God wants from us isn't what's left over from your time. He doesn't want you to pursue good marks at school and pursue a sport and pursue your video games and pursue your friends and then with everything that's left over, give it to him. No, no. And it's not wrong to pursue those things. I've literally made a career now out of playing sports with kids. That's what I do for a living. I don't think it's a sinful thing to play sports. Don't get me wrong. Don't, don't get me wrong. But what I think is sinful is to pursue those things over God. God needs to be the prime time of your pursuance. You've got to pursue God with the energy that you would pursue what you want to do yourself. You've got to pursue God with the energy I pursued rugby league with. Or you guys can think to yourself what I want to do, whether it's good marks, whether it's, whether it's whatever. You guys can think to yourself what you guys want to do with your life. 
and you've got to pursue righteousness of God with that integrity and with that focus. What God wants isn't the cartilage-filled ribs that I was served that night. He wanted the prime ribs that the other guy was served. And at this point, we're going to shift focus now. Let's talk about the pursuits, pursuit of righteousness. Pursuit of righteousness. How do we go about pursuing righteousness? What does it mean to set God up as your focus and your drive? How do you set God up as what you want to strive towards? Well, we're walking in the Spirit and spiritual things get pulled into us, but how do we begin walking in the Spirit? What's the first step you need to take? I think the first step is pretty obvious, and it's, it's a pretty easy walk to start taking, but also at the same time, it's probably one of the hardest walks you'll do because there are so many things that are going to try and pull you away from that walk. It's not hard to walk in the Spirit, but at the same time, it is incredibly hard. First thing you need to do is... Have a relationship with God. Be a born-again Christian. Read your Bible. Pray every day. We don't sing those songs in Sunday school for no reason. You start reading your Bible. You start praying every day. In my, my time is in the morning. I wake up in the morning and I sit down. I have a cup of coffee. I read my Bible and I spend time praying. If I miss that in the morning, my entire day is off. It doesn't feel right. I feel lethargic. I feel flat. I feel like something is missing. I read my Bible in the morning. I pray to God, and I wake up with such energy. I don't know what it is. I just wake up, and I'm, I'm renewed. I'm ready for the day that's ahead. So if you want to start pursuing a righteous living for God, start with reading his Bible, praying every day. And naturally, as you start doing that, you start getting drawn in to other things of the Spirit, things like hanging around people who are like-minded, hanging around people at church who believe the same things that you believe and do the same things that you do, and you can keep each other accountable. Hey, did you, did you have your morning devotion this morning? And even if you lie to them and say, yeah, I did, but you really didn't, all of a sudden that guilt is bearing on your conscience and you start becoming, okay, I'm going to do it for the next morning, or you start becoming more mindful of those things. Start coming to church and hear it, for, not for the purpose of seeing your mates, but for the purpose of hearing God's word. Why? Well, you've, you've read something in the Bible and you've understood it one way. Someone else reads it and gets a different perspective on the same passage and it enlightens you and helps you understand the passage that you've read. If you're reading your Bible every day and you're hearing sermons on those passages from church, then you get a better understanding of those passages. You get a better understanding of what the Bible's talking about. And, and, and start walking in that pattern. Start reading your Bible. Start praying every day coming to church as often as you can, hearing God's word and revolving around things of the spirit. And naturally what happens is your target becomes righteousness. Your, tar your target becomes what God wants you to do with your life. You start straying away from the flesh. What am I going to do for a career? What team is going to win the season this year? All these things that happen in this world that are designed literally to distract you from your main focus start falling away. But you slip up. You forget, your, you forget to read your Bible. You don't pray. And you start to stray. You start wandering off. And the things of the flesh can so easily draw you in. So to hunger and thirst after righteousness isn't just to simply make a dedication to read your Bible every once in a while and to pray when you feel like it. To truly hunger and thirst is to strive to read your Bible and pray and focus on things of the Spirit like you would focus on food after coming home from a long day of work without eating, or to focus on having a drink of water after working out in the sun all day and coming inside and your throat is parched. What God wants us to do, what Christ wants us to do with this beatitude is to give God our prime rib, to give him our absolute best time. And you're allowed to do everything else. You're allowed to focus on getting good marks at school, and if you want to play a sport, you can play a sport. Or you can do what you'd will with the rest of the time. But make sure what the re it's with the rest of the time, not with your prime time. Make the focus things of God, things of righteousness. With the rest of the time, you can fill it in how you'd like. Let's have a word of prayer.